Brothers and sisters, welcome back to the Carver household. Uh, I've got a topic I'm uh, really excited to share with you today. It's helped me and opened up a lot of understanding and given me insights into my patriarchal blessing. I hope it will do the same for you. Before I begin, I wanted to give a shout out to some good friends serving a mission in New Zealand and to all of the New Zealand Kiwi Saints. We say uh, hello from the States here. Uh, the uh, mission of Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, I had the opportunity to teach in the seminary and the institute uh, programs for a total of 37 years and had an opportunity to ask a lot of my students which tribe they were from uh, far and away. Uh, probably well into the 90, maybe even 95% of them were from the tribe of Ephraim. And of course, the question almost always came up, why are there so many from the tribe of Ephraim? If we did find some additional ones, they were usually from Manasseh. And so the question became, why is that? And why is that in our patriarchal blessing? And what's the significance of that? That was a great question for me because my patriarchal blessing said that the time would come when I would come to greatly appreciate my gospel heritage. And at first I wondered if that had to do the, with the fact that some of my ancestors were pioneers actually on both sides of my family, uh, uh, but came to understand that it meant more than that. It uh, was actually uh, something that goes all the way back into uh, the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today. This is kind of a part two of uh, the House of Israel presentation. If you haven't seen that one and talks about the gathering, the scattering and gathering of Israel, that might be helpful for you to review prior to this one. Uh, because this one takes the next step as far as the, uh, the mission given to both Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, I wanted to start with one of my favorite quotes by uh, uh, President Packer. Uh, he said, It is a source of strength and encouragement to know who we are and what we have and what we must do in the work of the Almighty. Okay, So those three things will give us strength and they will give us encouragement to understand those three things. The three things are, okay, are who we are, what we have, we'll talk about that in a second, and what we must do in the work of the Almighty. What the Lord has called us to do with what we have and, and, uh, and putting us in a position to be who we are. I'm going to change the order on that in the presentation just a little bit. Uh, hopefully it will make more sense if we approach it from this uh, vantage point. I'm going to talk about who we are. Secondly, what we must do in the work of the Almighty. Okay? who we are, what the Lord's called us to do, and then what He's given us to be able to do that. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about who we are. Uh, a patriarchal blessing is usually considered uh, uh, blessings that, that give us glimpses into the future. Uh, but in reality, uh, a, a, uh, a patriarchal blessing also looks backward. Okay? Because in the blessing, uh, everyone's blessing, you'll hear uh, phrases like this, uh, either that you're a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or it will say you're of the house of Israel, and then it will, it will talk about a specific tribe that you are from, okay? Well, that information tells you a little bit about who you are, and it goes backwards into the pre-mortal life and giving you a look at that. So a patriarchal blessing is not just a look forward, patriarchal blessing looks backwards in telling you a little bit about who you are. Uh, this quote by Elder Melvin J. Ballard, this is uh, President Ballard's grandfather who was also an apostle, he says this, there was a group of souls tested, tried, and proven before they were born into this world and the Lord provided a lineage for them. That lineage is the house of Israel. See now he's talking about who we were before we were born. That lineage is the house of Israel, the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their posterity. Through this lineage were to come the true and tried souls that had demonstrated their righteousness in the spirit world before they came here. So do you see, if he's telling us uh, that we're of the house of Israel, or that we're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's telling you about who you were before you were born. 
that you had qualified, not that you were better than, the Lord doesn't believe in better than, but that you had qualified, okay, as a true and tried soul that wanted to participate and be a servant of the Lord uh, in the Lord's work. Well, he took those, that group of people, and he sent them down through a special lineage. Okay, that's what Elder Ballard was talking about, the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons, Manasseh, and Ephraim. We're going to go a little bit more into detail on that, but, but uh, the question rises up, uh, why did God send us down through the house of Israel? Okay. Well, uh, uh, that's to explain who we are. It identifies us with our mission. Okay? In knowing who we are, He sends us down through the house of Israel with a certain assignment to do, which leads us to the next part. What we must do in the work of the Lord, uh, in, the, in uh, the work of the Almighty. We're going to go into uh, uh, the Pearl of Great Price, Abraham 2. Okay? in which the Lord is speaking to Abraham and says this, giving us some insights into the mission He's called us to do. My name is Jehovah, and I know the end from the beginning. Therefore, my hand shall be over thee. God knows everything, and the Lord's hand and power will be with Abraham. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee above measure. Okay. So great that the, the blessings will be on your ability to measure them. I will make thy name great among all nations, and thou shalt be a blessing unto thy seed after thee, that in their hands they shall bear this ministry and priesthood unto all nations. To take the gospel and the authority to uh, perform the ordinances, to take those blessings to all nations. That's the assignment given to Adam or to Abraham and his posterity. And I will bless them through thy name. For as many as receive this gospel shall be called after thy name. Right? In your patriarchal blessing, descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they'll be called after thy name. You 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 inherit that. And shall be accounted thy seed. Right? If a person uh, uh, is not a member of the house of Israel, Joseph Smith says when they are baptized, their blood changes and they are adopted into the house of Israel. So if they aren't house of Israel, they be still become his seed and become the seed of Abraham. I had a, uh, one of my uh, gals in my ward, a, a good sister in my ward, who came up after I'd made a presentation like this, and she said, I finally get my patriarchal blessing. My patriarchal blessing said, I wasn't born in the house of Israel, but I was adopted into the house of Israel. We'll talk a little bit about more about that in a few minutes. Okay? They shall be accounted thy seed, and shall rise up and bless thee as their father. And I will bless them that bless thee. And I will curse them that curse thee, and in thee, that is in thy priesthood, and in thy seed, that is in thy priesthood, so in your priesthood, and the priesthood of your seed. For I give unto thee a promise that this right, the priesthood, shall continue in thee and in thy seed after thee. That is to say, the literal seed, okay, the literal descendants, or the seed of the body, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, now he's giving you and me an insight into what he's asking Abraham and all of his posterity to do. Even with the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation and even, even of life eternal. So there you have it. Okay, that's what the Lord wants us to do in the work of the Almighty. Explain to Abraham, who is the father of the faith, right? Well, let's jump into, well, so here we have God's promises to Abraham and the world, and they focus on his seed. That's you and me. There's our mission. That's what he's sent us down to do. That's what we volunteered to do, that we wanted to be a part of that. Let's get some more insights through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 49. Beautiful, beautiful chapter. If you take time, the whole chapter is wonderful, but we'll just capture a few verses here. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. From the womb. Before we were born, we were raised up. We were trained. We were taught. We were prepared to be his servant. To come down. Okay? To do what? To bring Jacob. 
Jacob's name was changed to Israel, becomes the house of Israel, the family of Israel, right? To bring Jacob again to him. Here Isaiah is saying we were raised up before we were born to do that. Though Israel be not gathered. Now, that's not the best translation of that, okay? The King James scholars, uh, there's a better translation in, in some of our newer versions of the, uh, of, uh, the Bible of Isaiah. The more correct translation would read, to bring Jacob again to him so that Israel might be gathered, okay? Uh, uh, much more insight gained that way in, in some of the more uh, recent word-to-word -word, uh, word -word translations of the Bible that we have. Okay? So that Israel might be gathered, and yet I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, this is the Lord speaking back, it is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. It's a light thing. That's easy. That's easy. And to restore the preserved of Israel, to bring Jacob back to him. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So, job one, bring Jacob back to him. Okay? The house of Israel, the tribes of Israel, bring those back to him. Job two, save the rest of the planet. God loves all of his children. He will gather Israel first and then use Israel to bless the rest of the world, as was promised to Abraham. Let's keep going. Who are the Gentiles? Great question, okay? Who are the Gentiles? Well, we have some different definitions for that. These vary uh, according to uh, uh, what book you're using. Uh, the word, uh, uh, this word Gentile stems from the Hebrew word goy, which means a nation or stranger and was applied to nations that weren't of the house of Israel. They were not of the house. They were uh, a different nation. They were strangers to the house, right? It can also mean anyone who is not a Jew. In the Book of Mormon, it's used that way, right? If uh, uh, he, he says the Book of Mormon in the title page, the Book of Mormon was written to the Jew and to the Gentile. Okay, so anyone in, it was not considered a Jew would be considered a Gentile in that, in that scripture. It can also mean Israelites who were living in a Gentile nation. So they're of the house of Israel, okay? But they're living in a Gentile nation. So an example of that was Joseph Smith. Title page of the Book of Mormon, once again, it says it, will, it was sealed up by the hand of Moroni and will come forth by the hand of the Gentile. Well, who is that? It's Joseph, okay? So in that vernacular, Joseph is a Gentile, just not a, a Jew. So the mission of the house of Israel to assist our Father in heaven and His Son Jesus Christ in bringing Israel and the Gentiles save the whole world to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ takes them back to the Father. So now down to our topic, what roles do Ephraim and Manasseh specifically play in the gathering? So we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? This is the lineage from which it came down. Uh, 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 and, and to kind of explain the role of Abraham and Isaac, excuse me, uh, of Ephraim and Manasseh, I'm going to explain two terms that's, that has helped me a lot in uh, gaining some insight into the roles of Ephraim and, and Manasseh. First of all is the concept of the birthright, and secondly is the concept of the double portion. In the patriarchal order, which was practiced then, okay, uh, the firstborn son would inherit leadership of the family when the father died. And that's often spoken of in the scriptures as the birthright. Okay. After the father's death, he also received a double portion of the father's inheritance. And he became responsible to take care of the mother and all of the unmarried sisters. So he becomes the head of the family. He is the father, and he does receive a double portion, and one portion is for himself and his family, and the other is to take care of those uh, that have been left behind who aren't married or, or, uh, or his mother if she's still living. So, little quiz. 
in, uh, in this family, if we were using the birthright uh, uh, custom, when the father of this family dies, how many portions would his inheritance be divided into? Well, the answer would be it would be divided into three, right? Because you have two sons, and the first son gets a double inheritance, and the other son gets one. That always bothered me, because I'm the second born son in the family, okay? And I always used to ask myself, why would my brother get two, and I get one just because he's older? Well, it's not just because he's older. It's because he then becomes the head of the family and has additional responsibilities, okay? That's what the sa that second portion is for, save the family, take care of the family. So the birthright, given to the firstborn male, firstborn becomes the head of the, fa uh, head of the family at the death of the father, firstborn receives a double portion, and here's the important part, he can lose it. He can lose the birthright. You're gonna give the birthright and the double portion to someone who's evil? Hey, you're going to give it to Laman and Lemuel? Yeah, they're going to take care of mom and dad, all right. They wanted to kill him, right? You see why it passes down to Nephi. They lose the birthright because they are not in, uh, they're not righteous. So it can be passed down to the next righteous person, the next righteous brother, okay, the next righteous son. So from Abraham, and in the scriptures, we learn that Isaac gets the birthright, okay? Then it goes to Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel by the Lord. All biblical names mean something, okay? Michael means one who is like God. Daniel, God is my judge, okay? Samuel, God hears me. All the names meant something. Israel means uh, 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 God shall prevail, or as President Nelson was explaining, let God prevail. So different meanings for the word, but, but that, that, that God would change his name from Jacob. And this becomes his house, his family, the house of Israel. Okay? And these are his sons. It goes to Reuben, who is, whoops, it goes to Reuben, who, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take a break here. Let me just interject some stuff there where we talk about Jacob and Esau. Okay? Because... Uh, so many commentaries talk about the fact that Esau uh, had his blessing, his birthright stolen from Jacob. Okay? He had the blessing stolen. Well, you can't steal someone's blessings. Okay? You can't steal them. Okay? Jacob didn't steal the blessing from Esau. It, first of all, he's encouraged by his mother to do what he does. Why? Because his mother has received revelation at the birth of the twins. They're twins. Okay? Esau is born first but they're twins. He, she is told by revelation, the spirit speaks to her and says, the elder will serve the younger. Okay? Meaning the younger will get the birthright. So she knows that. And he's prompted to do what he does because he's encouraged by his mother. Next is, the scriptures say that Jacob despised his birthright. It did not mean anything to him. He's willing to sell it for a mess of pottage. A mess of pottage is just a serving of stew, okay? Serving of lentils. And he's starving. And Jacob says, well, trade me for your birthright. Yeah, what does a birthright mean to me if I die of starvation? He's not starving. Also, uh, uh, he will marry outside of the covenant, which breaks his father and mother's hearts. And he wants to kill Jacob. So does that sound like somebody that's worthy of the birthright? No. The birthright is given to Jacob. I can't steal your blessings. Okay, Esau loses the blessings. So it goes from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then it goes to Reuben. Okay? Reuben struggles with immorality, loses the blessing, and it goes to Joseph. Why Joseph? Okay, Why not to Simeon? Well, you have to understand that, that Jacob has four wives, right? He first marries Leah, and then when she cannot uh, give him any more children, she gives him Zilpah, and she has uh, Gad and Asher through, uh, 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 ha has Gad and Asher as sons. He marries Rachel, okay? That's his wife, second wife, 
Okay, these are servants or concubines. Concubine's not a bad word. Okay, uh, uh, but they did not have the same status as a wife. And uh, Rachel gives her servant Bilhah as one of his uh, wives. Uh, but when Reuben loses the birthright, it goes to the second wife, the firstborn of the second wife, which is Joseph. Okay? And scholars believe this is why uh, uh, Jacob gives him the coat of many colors to indicate to the sons that this boy will receive the birthright blessing and the double portion, which he does. Okay? So we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, uh, and then it's going to go to the two sons. So first of all, let's talk about what their names mean. When Joseph is in Egypt, he marries. Okay, When he gets out of prison, he marries, and he has two sons, and he names them, and their names are very significant. Remember I told you that biblical names mean something, right? And Joseph, and unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of the famine came. Okay, so this is before his family comes down. Which Asenath, the daughter of Pot uh, Potipharah, uh, priest of On, bear, uh, bear unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God said, He hath made me to forget all my toil. The name of Manasseh means to forget. Okay, now that may sound like a bad name, but Manasseh has brought forth the joy, the joy of his wife, the joy of children. Now has caused him to forget his family and all of the struggles he went through. Okay? He hath made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. The name Ephraim means fruitful. And you're going to see... Uh, he does become very fruitful, as does the, the tribe of Ephraim. When Jacob comes and is brought down with the sons, and they come and they are, are taken care of, uh, by, uh, uh, by this time uh, Joseph has risen to second, uh, only to Potiphar, uh, only to, sorry, only to Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, and while he is there and alive, Joseph wants his two sons blessed by their grandfather. And you know the story, but, but we gain great insights through the Joseph Smith translation of what happened and why and the promises given to the sons. Okay, listen to this. The, the JST is in italics, by the way. And it came to pass that after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick, so he's, he's dying, and he wants his boys to receive a blessing before his father dies. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh, older, Ephraim, second born. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son, Joseph, cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. He received a blessing from the Lord himself. And this is what he blessed him with. He said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people. And I will give this land, that becomes the land of Israel, right? And I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Land was very, very important to people. Okay, Posterity and land. Very important to people. And God is giving this. Lord Jehovah is giving this to him. And these are the promises given to Jacob. And now of thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee, uh, came unto thee in, into Egypt. Now here, here we start with our italics, right? Behold, they are mine. And the God of my fathers shall bless them even as Reuben and Simeon shall they be blessed. Notice how he says Ephraim and Manasseh, not Manasseh and Ephraim. They'll be blessed like Reuben and Simeon. Reuben and Simeon are the two sons. They will be blessed as though they were tribes. Okay? For they are mine, wherefore they shall be called after my name. Therefore they were called Israel. These become tribes in Israel. 
and the issue which thou begettest after them, any children you have after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in the inheritance, okay, in the tribes. Therefore, they were called the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. He is adopted, Joseph's two sons are adopted as tribes into the house of Israel, just like Reuben and Simeon. You see, Joseph gets a double portion in the house of Israel. Ephraim and Manasseh become tribes in Israel. And Jacob said unto Joseph, we're still in italics now, when the God of my fathers appeared unto me in Luz in the land of Canaan, he swore unto me that he would give unto me and unto my seed the land for an everlasting possession. This was the promised land for them. Therefore, O my son, he hath blessed me in raising thee up to be a servant unto me in saving my house from death. You were raised up to do what God had sent you to do. Okay? He doesn't know that God's hand is in all of this. But it's Joseph that saves the rest of the family and is able to fulfill the covenant that the, the Lord gives to Jacob. And the covenant is in delivering my people, thy brethren, from famine, which was sore in the land. Wherefore, wherefore means because of that, wherefore the, the God of thy fathers shall bless thee and the fruit of thy loins, that they shall be blessed above thy brethren. Your posterity will be blessed above because they're better known. He's going to explain the reason why here. And above thy father's house, they'll be blessed even more than Jacob will be blessed above thy father's house. For thou hast prevailed. Okay, interesting that word again, prevailed. And thy father's house hath, uh, thy father's house hath bowed down unto thee, even as it was shown unto thee before thou wast sold into Egypt by the hands of thy brethren. Okay, remember he has the dream that his brother and his mother and father will bow down to him. That's come to pass. Wherefore, thy brethren shall bow down unto thee from generation to generation under the fruit of thy loins forever. He's talking about the fact that his sons will receive the birthright. He's got the birthright. One of his sons will be, have the birthright. And they will be the head of the family. And the tribes will bow down to them. Not, not necessarily literally, but they'll bow down to them because they will have, they will become the head of the family. Okay? His sons will be. Uh, continuing on, for thou shalt be a light unto my people to deliver them in the days of their captivity. So he's delivered them once. Joseph and his, uh, Joseph has delivered his brothers and their families from physical starvation. But watch what he's going to, his posterity will do. Thou shalt be a light unto my people to deliver them in the days of their captivity from bondage and to bring salvation unto them when they are all together bowed down under sin. He's talking about the days when there's been the great apostasy and, and uh, we are captive by, uh, uh, by sin and by ignorance. The truth is gone. And who's going to restore that? Will be a descendant of the house of Joseph. Okay, Joseph Smith was of the house of Joseph. He was an Ephraimite, okay? And so the, 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 Joseph saves the family from physical starvation and his posterity will save the family from spiritual starvation. That's great stuff. Well, at this point, Joseph wants his boys to receive the blessings. Okay, we're back into the Bible now, uh, Genesis 48. And Israel beheld Joseph's son and said, who are these? He's uh, either totally blind or nearly blind. And Joseph said unto his father, they are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, bring them, I pray thee unto me, and I will bless them. This is what Joseph's want. This is why he's brought them there. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him. He, Joseph, is guiding his sons to his father. Okay, And he kissed them. This is Israel kisses them and embraces them. And Israel said to Joseph, 
I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. I thought you were dead. I thought I'd never see you again. And now I not only see you, I get to see your posterity. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. He's paying homage. He's giving uh, 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 honor to his father. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim, okay, in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand. Okay, he's guiding Ephraim, or excuse me, Manasseh to the right hand. That's the birthright. The right hand is the birthright. Okay, left hand. What's he going to do? Well, you saw the the the, the artist's conception. He's going to move his hands. He's going to put his right hand on Ephraim's head, left hand on Manasseh's head. Israel stretched out his right hand, <clears throat> and he laid it upon Ephraim, on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. That means knowingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Here's the blessing. This is the blessing on, his hand, on the head of these two sons. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. He's thinking his father can't see. He's confused. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know, there it is, wittingly, I know it, my son, I know it. I know what I'm doing, okay, I'm doing this for a reason. He also shall become a people. He, Manasseh, shall also become a people, and he shall also be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, fruitful, shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Interesting. Okay. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. That's, 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 that's great stuff. Uh, he's saying the day will come when, when people are giving out blessings. May you be blessed. May you have uh, all the blessings. They will, they will give blessings to the effect of God make thee as fruitful as Ephraim and Manasseh. That will be a praise, a, a blessing that people give in, the, uh, in times beyond this. Well, interestingly enough, Jewish blessings today, many Jewish parents still embrace the custom of blessing their children on Friday evening, right? Saturday is their Shabbat, their Sabbath. And on Friday evening, what do they say? What is the blessing? Now, I can't speak Hebrew, but this is what you would say to your daughters. May Elohim, may God bless you as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And to the sons, may God bless you as Ephraim and Manasseh. That prophecy has been fulfilled. So, does Ephraim still hold the birthright today? That's the question, right? He's given the birthright of the tribes. Is, does he hold the birthright today? Look what Brigham Young says. It is the house of Israel we are after, and we care not whether they come from the east, the west, the north, the south, from China, Russia, uh, England, California, North or South America, or some other locality. And it is the very lad on whom Father Jacob laid his hand that will save the house of Israel. He's saying it's, it's Ephraim. It's Ephraim. So, who we are, what God has for us to do. It will be Ephraim that has the charge to 
lead the house of Israel, has the firstborn, and receives the double blessing, right? And what we have, let's talk about that. Has Ephraim received a double portion in our day? Now, I know you can't speak to all the Ephraimites, uh, everyone in the house of Ephraim, okay, in, in the tribe of Ephraim. But Ephraim <clears throat> as a whole has been richly blessed. Watch when Moses blesses the 12 tribes, okay, before his death. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. We're going to jump a little bit here. This is in Deuteronomy 33. Let Reuben live and not die, and let his men uh, and let not his men be few. That's the whole blessing, as far as we know. <laughs> That's the blessing for Reuben. Okay, we're going to jump down to seven, and this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, "Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring unto him his people. Let his hand be sufficient for him, and be thou an help to him for his enemies." Okay, so little fuller blessing upon the house of Judah. And then we're going to jump to Joseph. Okay, you can go through all the tribes. Uh, they're pretty sparse in the blessings. And now watch the blessing he pours out upon the head of Joseph. This is Moses giving his blessings to the tribe of Joseph. Okay? And to Joseph, of Joseph, he said, Blessed of the Lord be his land, for the precious things of the heaven, for the dew, for the, the deep that couches beneath, for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the, uh, of the lasting hill. He's blessing him with the heavens, the earth, the land, okay, the, the things that are brought forth by the land. He's pouring out the blessings on the head of Joseph, okay? And for the, <clears throat> excuse me, and for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush. Who dwelt in the bush? He's talking about Jehovah who appeared to the man who's speaking, Moses in the bush, for the goodwill of him who dwelt in the bush, these blessings are coming upon Joseph. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brother. So he received the firstborn blessing, get the double portion, and his posterity will also. We can jump to Deuteronomy 33, uh, uh, sorry, verse 17. We're going from 16 to 17 here, same chapter. His glory, he's talking about Joseph, his glory is like the firstling, firstling of his bullock. His horns are like the horns of unicorns. Okay, Unicorns should be translated as wild ox. His horns, his glory, okay, will be uh, like the horns of the wild ox. With them, with his horns, okay, uh, uh, horns in, in Scripture uh, symbolizes power. An animal with horns is more powerful than an animal without horns. It symbolizes authority. It symbolizes priesthood. Okay? With his priesthood, with his power, with his authority, he will push the people together to the ends of the earth. Who will do it? Okay, Joseph. He's blessing Joseph. And who will do it? And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim. And they are the thousands of Manasseh. See, even here, you have more Ephraimites here than of the tribe of Manasseh. Okay. Uh, the Lord corrects, just to show you that even the Lord himself corrects some of the translations in the Bible. The Lord himself will correct this scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants. Watch what he says. Behold, they, referring to the two tribes, shall push the people together from the ends of the earth. They're not going to push them to the ends of the earth. They're gathering them. They're pushing them from the ends of the earth. One of the roles, major roles of uh, Joseph, take care of the rest of the family. I'm going to give you a double portion, your posterity, a double portion, so you can save the family. It will be Ephraim and Manasseh. If you go into the... This is one of my favorite places to be in the temple. I don't know all the reasons why, but I love going in the baptistry and there to see the twelve oxen uh, upon whom the Lord has laid on their backs the, the oxen. Okay, If the saints had a choice between an ox or horse to pull their wagons, they always chose the ox. The ox was more powerful, it was stronger. Okay, The ox is a symbol of work, symbol of strength, and with their horns 
Okay, now they have authority, they have power, and on their backs the Lord has laid the salvation of the whole world. Remember John 3 says no one gets to heaven without being baptized on their backs. Well, how many oxen are there really underneath the font right now? Do we have all 12 tribes gathered? No, we really only have two. We're gathering some additional ones in addition to that, but we really only have two tribes, main, okay, gathered in, in, in bigger numbers. Okay? And their job is to get the rest of the 12, the rest of the 12, and then the, those 12 will save the rest of the world. Okay? That's a, a great, great symbolism. Beautiful, powerful symbolism found in the baptistries of our temples. Uh, the scriptures say here, this is uh, uh, President Joseph Fielding Smith, that a um, uh, wonderful quote here, Ephraim has a wonderful mission to perform in this day. It is proper that he stand in place at the head, exercising the birthright in Israel. The gospel is being preached by Ephraim to the nations. It was essential, therefore, that Ephraim be the first gathered. There it is. Okay. So that, this is why you're seeing Ephraim coming forth in, in bigger numbers right now. Because they're better? No. Because they have the assignment. They have the assignment as head of the family. You've got to gather them first. Okay. And Ephraim will, Manasseh will play a role in that because he's of Joseph. Okay. But Ephraim has the birthright, has the responsibility, and is going to have the blessings to be able to do that. It was essential, therefore, that Ephraim be the first gathered, for he it is who is to prepare the way for the other tribes of Israel. Well, what are some of the blessings of the double portion? Are, are there blessings of the double portion that have been given to us, okay, given to the church, given to uh, uh, America, the nation here? Yeah, and there's a reason for that. We could talk about America itself, the freedoms that we've been granted here. We could talk about the Book of Mormon, okay? Uh, we'll talk about that one in a second, expand on that. We could talk about the priesthood, education that, that there is in this, in this country. Uh, the health now, uh, people are living longer. They, uh, they are able to do more. Uh, in their time. We're going to talk about that one too. Or a technology that's come forth that God has put into our hands. Brigham Young said all the major inventions that are going to be coming forth are, are designed for the saints to do the work of God. Okay, those are being brought forth in bounteous and number, amazing all of us. Okay, that I can look at my watch and, and, and talk to someone <laughs> across the, the planet uh, unbelievable. The, the, this is the day of the Jetsons, if any of you remember that. A uh, little cartoon series when I grew up. The prosperity. This has been a blessed nation. Uh, the time we've been blessed with. So let's take a couple of those just quickly and talk about just a couple of them. The land of America. In an epistle issued by the First Presidency, 1852, the invitation is to all of every nation, kindred and tongue, who will believe, repent, and be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, come home. Come to the land of Joseph, to the valleys of Ephraim. Don't we sing that song? O Babylon, O Babylon, we bid thee farewell. We're going to the mountains of Ephraim to dwell. One of my favorites. Here's what President or Elder McConkie said. Certain lands were given to Israel for an inheritance in time and eternity for an everlasting possession, right? America is the land of Joseph. It was the home of the Nephite Israel who were of Joseph for a thousand years. It is the headquarters of the church in this final dispensation in which the church and kingdom of God are in the, the hands, sorry, not in the lands, are in the hands of Ephraim. Book of Mormon, okay? Book of Mormon was translated by an Ephraimite, okay? Joseph Smith and the Latter-day Apostles and Prophets are of Ephraim. The Book of Mormon is the stick of Joseph in the hand of, hands of Ephraim. And it is Ephraim who is to guide the destiny of the kingdom in the last days and to bring the blessings of the gospel to the other tribes of the family of Jacob. Priesthood keys. Okay? These are all things that are the double portion that God has given us. Priesthood keys. It is Ephraim today who holds the priesthood. Priesthood keys. It is Ephraim who is building temples and performing the ordinances in them for both the living and for the dead. When the lost tribes come, and it will be a most wonderful sight and a marvelous thing when they do come to Zion in fulfillment of the promises made through Isaiah and Jeremiah, 
they will have to receive the crowning blessings from their brother Ephraim, the firstborn in Israel. Why? Because uh, uh, Ephraim has the, the priesthood keys. They're the brethren. They're the 15 men uh, now at this present time who hold the priesthood keys. Time. That's another great blessing we have. This was a chart someone's done some homework on <clears throat> that I think uh, given some insights to me here. Lifetime work hours in the 18, late 1800s. Okay, for a, a person normally put in about 180,000 work hours. Okay, they usually worked a 14 to 16 hour day, about double what we do now. Their time of leisure was 43,000 hours. Look at it today in 1995. This is research this Robert Wapples, I guess that's how you say his name, has done. Lifetime work hours, look how much that's dropped. And look how much our leisure hours have, have increased. God has made it possible for us to do more. And He's put the tools and the means and the prosperity in our hands to do it. For of whom much is given, much is required. Okay? He's expecting and we volunteered. We wanted to be a part of this. And it's time that we do what we volunteered that we, we said we'd do. This is from DNC 133, and uh, uh, I will remind you of some of the quotes that we've just read. And they who are in the north country shall come in remembrance before the Lord, and their prophets shall hear his voice, and shall no longer stay themselves. Don't know all that that means. And they shall smite the rocks, and the ice shall flow down at their presence. Don't know what that means. And in highway shall be cast up in the midst of the great deep, their enemies shall become a prey unto them. And in the barren deserts there shall come forth pools of living water. Barren deserts seem to talk about those lands where, where there's been no gospel. Maybe it's the communist countries uh, where the, the gospel has not been allowed for a long time. And, and those that were parched ground will have living waters there. Okay, The gospel will come back. And the parched ground shall no longer be a thirsty land. And they shall bring forth their rich treasures. That could be a lot of different things. We know from 2 Nephi 29 that one of the treasures will be their scriptures. They shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servants. And the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. And there shall they fall down and be crowned with glory even in Zion by the hands of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. And they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy. Behold, this is the blessing of the everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel and the richer blessing upon the head of Ephraim and his fellows. Why, why richer blessings? Because they've done the work. The ones that have gone forth and done the work receive the greater blessings. Not because there's any better than. Again, the Lord doesn't support the better than theory. Okay. Now, what about the other tribes? My, my students will say, what about the other tribes? And what are they supposed to do? And what about Manasseh? And what is he supposed to do? And <clears throat> I don't know all the answers to that, but I like this quote by Elder McConkie. All the tribes have played and shall play their part in the Lord's strange act. Each has provided and shall provide prophets and seers. And the members of each stand equally before the Lord in seeking and obtaining eternal life. There it is. No better than. Christ came of Judah, as did most of the prophets and apostles of old. Moses and Aaron were of Levi. Paul of Benjamin and the Nephite prophets were of Manasseh. So all play their different roles. Okay, It doesn't matter. But this explains to us the responsibilities that we have. And Ephraim has to lead out and save the rest of the family and use the blessings we have to do so. So, coming back to this original quote, it is a source of strength and encouragement to know who we are and what we have and what we must do in the work of the Almighty. Here's a prophet today who is stressing this more than a prophet's in that I can remember. Just, just hitting this so hard. Okay, You were sent to earth at this present time. The most crucial time in the history of the world. You ever thought of that? You're living in the most crucial time in the history of the world? To help gather Israel. 
there is nothing happening on the earth right now that is more important than that. Can you imagine that? There's nothing more important going on the planet. Nothing. There is nothing of greater consequence than this. Absolutely nothing. Okay, these are superlatives he's using. Okay, when a prophet uses superlatives, my ears perk up a little bit. This gathering should mean everything to you. This is the mission for which you were sent to earth. That's great stuff. So, my question. Will you accept that mission? Okay. And how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, there's lots of things that we can do. We can teach our children. We can raise them in righteousness. That brings Israel. Isn't that gathering Israel to Christ, our posterity? We can fulfill our church callings, okay, in, in what we do and what we teach and who we set the examples for. We can minister to those who we are assigned. We can prepare our children and ourselves to serve missions. We can let our light and love shine for those around us, member, non-member, doesn't matter. We can do family history work. We can do temple work, okay? My hope, brothers and sisters, is that we can accept this charge that the Lord has given us to be faithful. I'm just excited. I'm just honored. I, I have a great appreciation, as was told to me in my patriarchal blessing, for the heritage I have in the gospel. May we be true and faithful in the mission that God has given us by using all of the, the means and the blessings He has to bless the lives of others and to bring Jacob and the Gentiles back to Him is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.